Hello, everyone, and welcome to CoLab Conversations. I'm Raquel Wilson from Women's CoLab, and today we are so excited to have Charlotte Owen with us. Now, Charlotte is the editor in chief of Bustle and Elite Daily, both platforms that many of us know and love. And she's had an amazing career journey that I can't wait to dig into in just a moment here. But just as a reminder, we are live, so make sure you put in your questions for Charlotte and LinkedIn. We'll get to as many as we can. With that, Charlotte, again, we thank you so much for being here with us. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, I figured we could just jump right in. A lot of times we like to ask our guests to just give us an idea of their story. Let's start with how you got to where you are today. So, um, oh, good, good, good question. Um, I started out my career at um, Vanity Fair. Um, I was an assistant there for um, nearly two years, and then I ended up staying there in total for six and a half years before I left and joined Bustle shortly afterwards, launching Bustle's UK arm. And um, then I, after I'd done that for about 18 months, they asked me to come over and run Bustle US. Um, so my my route, I guess, like from Vanity Fair generally, I did a lot of different type things there. I, for I was um, an assistant. I was a photo editor for a year. I was um, an assistant editor um, on our UK special issues. I worked on our UK website. Um, I did a lot of different things, and it was actually really valuable to just try some stuff out. Um, before that, I done lots of internships. I studied history and English literature at university, so I hadn't done like a journalism degree. Um, and I interned at some newspapers and some magazines and then actually had to move back home to Birmingham, which is a city a few hours from London, because I didn't have a job yet. And it was, you know, a tough time um, in the markets and there weren't many jobs going. So um, I ended up moving back home and then staying in touch with the people who I'd interned for. And then when a job came up, I was lucky enough to uh, get a break and was able to get a foot in the door. But it took a while. It took honestly a year from me graduating to getting a job. And my parents were like, well, what the hell are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was never, I guess, because of how like difficult that start was, I was never like super ideological or rigid about what exactly my next job would be from whatever job I was in. I would just take any opportunity that came my way that meant more responsibility or more money or just like a chance to grow. Um, and so my route in that way has been like not super planned, to be honest. Um, and so, yeah, it's a bit sort of just taking the opportunities that came my way. Yeah, well, I'm seeing common themes of just being resilient in those downtimes where maybe you were still trying to figure out what you wanted to do. And then also just being open to many different experiences, which I think is also very vital and important in a career journey. Um, and so ultimately you ended up in the, the publishing industry. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, I, I think there's probably a lot of people who are tuning in right now who have interest in that. Is there any advice that you could give to the audience um, about breaking into the publishing industry? We know that each industry has its own unique challenges. Um, and so with that in mind, what advice would you give? Um, I would stay flexible, um, like listen before you sort of, um, you know, it sounds like very old fashioned to say listen before you speak, but I mean that in the sense of like gather all information before you make a decision. Like, so you might be offered something that you think isn't quite right, but like take the meeting, take have the conversation, like gather all the information and then make a decision. I think staying flexible and being open minded, the industry is changing so quickly, and um, just the the fact that the economy in the state that it is at the moment with the, so you know the fears of recession means that we are having to be so light-footed and react so quickly to um changes that it you you kind of like can't be too sort of like i am doing this and i am going to wait until this happens you sort of just have to roll with the punches um Sounds obvious, but obviously just like be the hardest working person in the room like make yourself indispensable and I know this is kind of like sort of contrary to some of the advice given out these days, but like I've always taken on extra work and like offered to do other stuff. And that 
is, you know, some people might say, oh, well, that's how you end up doing work for free or, and, you know, I'm not suggesting that you do it forever, um, but I think that taking on new new things as a, as a method to like finding new opportunities can be really, really valuable. Um, and, you know, periods like we're going through at the moment in publishing where there are layoffs and job losses and restructurings, that's often a period when there's actually kind of ample opportunity to like, if, if you're fortunate enough to stay, to really try something different or like, you know, everyone's a little bit short staffed, you can get some experience in an entirely different area. Um, so I think you just have to be sort of like, stay working really hard and be a bit of a like opportunist when the opportunities arise. Um, so that would be my key advice. I like that. I think it's about striking the balance. Like you said, you want to make sure that you're known for putting out hard work and you sign yourself up, but you also want to make sure that it's not something that you do forever and you know your value and your worth, but it is definitely good advice there. Mm. Um, you talked a bit in your career journey about your progression and at some point, you know, moving back home, um, not knowing, you know, you're still looking for a job. Is there anything that when you look back at those times that you wish you knew then that you know a little bit more about now that you've started your career? Um, it's so difficult. I feel like it's such a cliche, but it, it really is that, you know, every there's more way of one, there's more than one way of getting where you want to go. And so it's like comparison is the thief of joy, right? And so you see how other people are doing and you see what they're going through and you're like, well, why aren't why aren't I in that position yet? And the truth is like everyone is on their own path and it's, I think it, it's very easy to be hard on yourself in those moments, but you kind of just have to stay the course. Um, and it's, you know, stay the course, but also if it's really not working for you, like take risks, take risks and, you know, don't be afraid to like try something different. When I left Condé Nast, I was going to be freelance. I was like, I don't think I'm getting more any more out of this. I think this is the time for me to move on. And so that was one of the few times where I've taken like a pretty big risk. And when I moved to uh, New York in January 2020, um, I obviously was like, yeah, my New York adventure, here I go. And then COVID happened and everyone was telling me to move home. Everyone was like, just get home. Why are you still still there? Like, just go back to the UK. You're going to be stuck on your own. And I was stuck on my own in my apartment. But um, in that moment, I just was like, no, I'm going to I'm going to tough this out. It's going to be really hard. And it was really hard, harder than I ever thought. But um, you, I, I'm like so glad I did it. And so I think also, like, I wish I'd known in a way when I was younger that it it's not like you get to a certain level and then it, you're like done. It's like you all, it's kind of this constant wave of challenges and everyone, okay. people's challenges come at different points. Um, and so you have to be like strategic about that. And then one of the other things that I think is, I don't know, I don't hear people talk about that much is that early in earlier in your career you almost have to you behave a different way to when you're senior in your career like especially starting out in magazines it was very hierarchical and you really had to like kiss the ring and deference and I'm not saying that that's how it should be I'm just saying that that's how it was when I started out in 2011 and I think being okay with the fact that like a lot of people use this expression like bring your whole self to work I'm not personally a believer in that. That's not to say that I don't think that you should be yourself at work. It's more that like I am paid to perform a function. I come in and I perform that function and then I go home. And I think in a way that allows me to claim more space for myself and my own needs in my own time rather than, you know, being feeling like I need to have all my needs met at work. And the other piece of that is that you can you know, when you're in a role at work, you play a role to some extent. And it's my role now to be like a leader and be decisive and give clear direction. When I was 22, that was not my role. And so I had like a slightly almost different personality at work because I was listening and learning. And of course, I'm still trying to do all of those things. But um, it's you, you can evolve and you don't like you don't need to be this same version of yourself all the time. And it's fine to grow and be different. And that's part of the process. 
Yeah, I think that's great advice. I, I what you said about um, bringing your whole self to work is, I think, another um, moment where we think about balance because a lot of times when you go to work, you go and you work, and then when you get home, you can really dig into what you really want to do in life. And there's a separation, which is kind of nice because you don't want your whole work to become your life. And I think that's a nice way to think about it so that a lot of times we talk about work-life balance. That is a way that you can maybe achieve that. Um, and you also talked about the industry changing and something else that stuck with me was when you said having to be okay with the culture maybe being of, let's say, kiss the ring, like you said. Have you seen anything specific to women in that space, in that industry that has maybe changed, changed for the better, for the worse? I know there's been a lot of cultural moments with um, women empowerment recently and their careers in corporate America and the entertainment business. Is that something that we're also seeing, you would say, in publishing? Yes, definitely. I mean, thank God it's not like how it was when I started in so many ways. And I was like, definitely the worst was over in terms of the way that assistants and such were treated. <laughs> but it was still, um, I, I would I would say that everyone is just, there's less of a, less of a, uh, certainly from my experience and at the companies I'm at and the people I work with, when I was younger, there were certain leaders who were just like, this is the way I am, and I require these things, and I will be like this kind of person to work with, and that will be difficult for you, but that's who, that's just what I do. I don't mm. think leaders are in, rightfully, are not behaving that way anymore. And so I think that there is more, um, th there's less sort of, I'm trying to think of the right word, um, I guess it's more respectful, the environment, compared to when I started. Yeah. And um, th there is, it, it, you know, I, I was told to lose weight or wear my hair differently earlier in my career uh, or dress differently. And certainly none of that goes on where I work now, thankfully. And um, I'm very glad for that. And that has been a, a nice shift. And it definitely feels like it's a, a more inclusive environment in that way. Um, but I, that, like I said, I'm also speaking as a white female leader of a team. And so I, I can't speak to what the experience of starting as a 23-year-old now is. But um, that's definitely a shift that I have noticed. Well, that's refreshing to hear. And I'm so sorry that you've had to deal with some of those things before. And it's it sounds like it's a common experience. So that's that's sad and disappointing. But I'm happy to hear that it's going in a different direction. and as you as a leader and others like you who are fostering better culture and that's and it's good to hear yeah we hope so right <laughs> we can only hope um since we're on the topic of leadership um you you spoke on being a leader having to change maybe your style what is your leadership style you would say um i think i am I try, I, I'm direct. I try to be kind. I try to be fair. I try to be um, straightforward about what I want. Um, I like feel very sort of like I'm, I have confidence in my decisions and my decision making. And I try to like help that bring clarity to the teams that I manage. Um, but I also, if someone pushes back on something and they feel strongly, like, Great. I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm, I try to be flexible. And if someone really disagrees with me, then they should, they can tell me and we can do something differently. Um, so I, I try to be compassionate, but I also think that I have seen the sort of the challenges that come with when people aren't direct. And I think particularly with management style, people think that they're being compassionate and kind by not pointing out when something hasn't been done the right way or to a high enough standard or and then when it comes to end of year and people want feedback or raises and then their manager says oh no you're not getting a that bigger raise because you weren't good at these things weren't good enough like that's 
not fair and it's not helpful to the employee. Um, and so I think sometimes, you know, I've tried really hard as a manager to put myself in uncomfortable situations like every day if it's like doing the right thing of giving difficult feedback and you know giving difficult feedback kindly like you know there's no, there's no you don't i don't i don't i'm not i don't mean it sounds like terrible to say i don't have any feelings about it but like if something isn't good enough or not the, the way that i would like it to be done i don't ever feel angry about that i'm more just like right these are the things that we need to do and i think as a manager you owe it to people to give them that feedback um and i think sometimes people have like hidden behind I'm just trying to be kind to everyone and not, t but you've got to share people like that's what people were like that with me early on and it really helps you get better. So I try to be, um, yeah, as kind and compassionate, but also really direct and straightforward about what it is that I want and what I need and what the team um, can do differently. I also try to obviously give a lot of positive feedback whenever stuff is going well. Um, I really trust my deputies and the senior leaders that we have on the site. I'm not interested in being in the weeds with them. I trust them. It's their decisions to make. And if they make a mistake and something goes wrong, it's fine. Like, you know, we're not, we're not brain surgeons. And so if something, I really try to create a culture where trying something and it not working out is fine. That's just a lesson. Like if we try something and it doesn't work out and we keep doing the same thing, that's a different thing, but trying something and it not working is just, part of growth um right. so yeah i tried to do all of those different things um and also you know i try to be like to the extent that people are in the office um being present and you know just like a normal human like i i sit on the floor with everyone else i'm sitting in someone else's office right now um so yeah just trying to be a regular just i don't know just be like normal <laughs> That's awesome. It sounds like you're a great leader, fostering growth and transparency is key. Being real and honest with people, those are very key. Um, with that in mind, do you encourage mentorship? Do you have a mentor yourself? You know, it was really interesting when I, um, thinking about that question in advance, I don't have like a specific mentor, but I have a lot of like, I've been very, very lucky in my whole career to have built some really strong, solid like friendships with people both my age and 20 years older and even older than that and people who are starting out as well. And so I have never, I, I mean, in the UK, we d like mentorship doesn't really exist in the same way that it does here, I don't think. So I never like thought about it in that way growing up, but I certainly did have mentors um, in the UK. Um, Henry Porter, a very brilliant uh, British journalist, was a huge like advocate and support for me. And Annie Holcroft, who is the publishing director of Vanity Fair for years, again, also massive mentor. Um, I've tried to like help other people with their growth in their career, but I'd, I've never really formalized it with a label. Um, and I also think I've learned a lot from people who aren't even in the same industry as me, people who are completely different, um, hearing about how their industries work and the way that they're managed or the way that they manage people or the way that, you know, they run their teams, I think has also been really valuable. So I guess I'd say, no, I don't have a men like specific one person mentor, but I'm very lucky to have like a great network of people in the UK and the US who have given me great advice and guidance. That's great. Yeah, I, I think from doing a couple of these now, I often hear that people either have a network that they can lean on and it may not be formal, but they know that if they call them, they'll get the advice. Or some people may have more of a formalized structure where they have one-on-ones on Thursdays. Yeah. Um, and it, mentorship is something that comes up a lot. And personally, I um, have been very much encouraged just from doing this series and being a part of Women's Collab to find a mentor for myself um, and have been encouraged to do that. And it's netted out for me and I'm happy to be able to have another network. And it's nice to be able to be able to rely on um, the other experiences of other folks. You never know what can bring something to the table that you may not have yeah. experienced yourself. And I think often people, when people think about mentors and, and guidance from others, people often think about those who are more senior to them. But I learn a lot all the time from people who are much more junior than me and, you know, hearing about how they're solving problems or how they're doing things. And 
one of the best pieces of advice I would give people starting out in your career is like really invest in your friendships and relationships with your peers, because by the time you're in your mid thirties, like me, they're all in similar jobs and you really become each other's life rafts of like, God, like I get on the phone and they'll be like, this happened at the, my, my place this week. And you're like, Oh God, that happened at mine last week. This is how we handled it or whatever. And, um, your relationships with your peers are like, just as valuable as your relationships with any mentors or bosses and they will be your lifelines in so many scenarios yes definitely have learned that okay. um so let's move on now i want to talk about some of your experiences just as being um, editor-in-chief of bustle and elite daily can you talk about um i know i'm sure that you've talked to many different people are there any stories that really stand out for you that maybe you've met somebody who really impacted you on a personal level? Such a good question. I think um, it's almost like too many to every interaction. If you really listen to people when they're talking, I think you come away with something from every interaction. Like I did an event last year with a poet from um New York, who does kind of like slam poetry and listening to her poetry was really moving and like a completely different experience. But I, you know, you, you find something in the emotion of what she was, I found something in the emotion of what she was saying that felt incredibly relatable. And then I interviewed last year, Dame Harriet Walter, who's um, a British actress. She was in succession. She played the mom of the, um, the Roy children. And we had this brilliant conversation about, you know, eating disorder. Like I also had an eating disorder and recovery from that and, you know, dating and marriage. And it was like whether, she, you know, she wanted to get married at the age that I am now in these very sort of like interesting conversations. And um, that was incredibly moving. When I was at Vanity Fair, we um, did an event with One Young World and, we flew to Bogota in Colombia and photographed the Colombian president in the Colombian presidential palace. Like you just have, it's, you really like have see things from a completely different um, perspective, but um, you know, you can, if, you know, you should talk to everyone at work the same way, right? You know, any, anyone that you encounter at work, whether you're like interviewing a celebrity or like chatting to, your boss or a colleague on your team or you know someone who works on the front desk like you can learn something from everyone and you know if you like talk and ask questions people really share interesting parts of their life and it can really inform like the ideas that you come up with for work sounds like human conversations back to being human like you said exactly yeah um and charlotte we do have a question um mm -hmm. from jen so, and I think this is going back to what we were talking about earlier about um, maybe having those mentorship conversations or talking about feedback. So the question is, was there a difficult conversation a leader had with you at some point in your career that you could point to that stands out that helped you grow? Yes, definitely. One that really stands out for me is when I started at Bustle and I was running Bustle UK and my then manager, Kate Ward, who was the... Um, global editor-in-chief of all BDG brands at the time. I was, we'd not long launched and I was working like all the hours God sent and was completely flat out trying to do everything myself. And she said to me, a good leader can step away from their work and they have trained all of the, their employees to be able to like do their jobs and they can step away and start working on new things. And a good leader has trained their team to be able to like work without them. And that was like a very, I think I was in such a state of like, I need to prove myself that you are getting, especially early in your career that you like don't want anyone to be able to dispense without you because then you're like, you feel like you're at risk of like being dispensable. But actually when you're a manager, it's very different. Like as a manager, you, you, you sh your team should be able to operate without you. And if they can, then that means you've empowered the leaders within your organization to, and it means that from a strategic point of view, you can really start thinking about like, what's this project that we haven't even started yet that actually is gonna be really help us grow as a company or for me as an individual. And so that was a really powerful piece of feedback that 
really changed the way that I was like approaching things. Like instead of, it's, I guess it's a bit like being a parent when you like, you know, you don't want your kid to have to need you to tie their shoelaces every day. <laughs> You've got to teach them to tie their own shoelaces so you can, so they grow up and be independent. And I think that was a really powerful piece of feedback for me. Yeah, that's, that's awesome feedback and really goes to show how important it is to have that mutual trust between your leaders and folks you work with is yeah. key. So I think we're at a point now where we can maybe have a little fun. I would love to ask you more about what you're reading now, what you're listening to, anything that pop culture that you're enjoying right now. Um, we'll love to know more about that. So I'm at the moment, I'm just finishing this book called Crazy by Jane Fever, who's a British writer. It's really brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm about to start, I've just also finished a book called Bad Summer People by Emma Rosenblum, who is actually my boss. She's the chief content officer at BDG. It came out last week. It's a very, very fun beach read um, set in a sort of, it's kind of a white lotusy, like privileged um, Long Island, like Fire Island beach community. Um, it's like murder and intrigue and affairs. It's very fun. And then I'm about to start um, a book called The Alyssas by Samantha Leach, who's actually Bustle's editor at large. And it's about three um, girls called Alyssa who met in the troubled teen industry. And then after about five or 10 years after they graduated, they were all dead. And so it's about like their experience um, in recovery and how that industry has been quite harmful. So those are I've just recently finished, finishing at the moment. And then um, next on my reading list. Awesome. I've been looking for some beach reads. Uh -huh. I am ready for the beach. So I will be checking those out. Yes. Love a good beach read. Yes. Um, and Charlotte, since we're talking about content, where can folks enjoy content from Bustle and Elite Daily? So um, bustle.com and elitedaily.com are the home of our, like most of our written content, obviously. And then um, we also are pretty big on TikTok and Instagram and, and um, all of those kind of platforms and YouTube. Um, which is so exciting because one of my favorite things to do when I'm late at night when I'm like sat in bed and can't yet get to sleep is I go and like read the comments on our Instagram posts about stories because it's just, I mean, as a journalist, that's one of the things you always want to do is an elicit a reaction. And I, as I've got older, I've become much thicker skinned in the sense if someone doesn't like something, I'm like, okay, but you had a, you had an opinion. We made you feel something and, you know, right. you learn, hopefully learn something about yourself and your own point of view through doing that and that is very rewarding and gratifying even if people don't always agree so um I love going on our social accounts and reading the feedback yes crowdsourcing feedback is <laughs> amazing it's it's the truth the raw truth so. totally it's the raw truth and you you like as you get older you get more confidence in even if people disagree with you saying I'm going to stick to my guns I think this is important and right. That comes as you get older, I think. Yes, for sure. Now, before we end, I do have to ask, we ask each of our guests for collab conversations, what piece of advice would you leave our audience with today? Um, work hard, say thank you, and you know, know your worth, and just be flexible, keep pushing. It's, I know they, they sound like cliches, but they are, they are true. That's why they're cliches, because yeah. they're so true. <laughs> yeah. Well, Charlotte, thank you so much for joining us again. And folks watching, I hope you enjoyed and were able to take away many insights that Charlotte shared with us. Make sure that you subscribe to our LinkedIn newsletter. We'll have our latest events, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye.